Hi folks, this is Andrew. Um, yeah, this one, we're gonna do posterior muscles of the thigh. So the muscles running down the back of the thigh. Um, by far the easiest of the three compartments of the thigh. Um, so yeah, remember your, the thigh, the upper leg, you break down into anterior, medial and posterior. This is by far the easiest of the three. Um, so we'll have a chat about the functions of these muscles, the function of this group. We'll talk about the nerve that innervates these muscles, and then we'll have a chat about the muscles themselves, where they come from, where they go, um, ways to remember where they are, how to find them, etc., etc. Um, so okay, so your the basics to build on. If you take nothing else away from this video, the things to remember are your posterior mem uh, posterior muscles of the thigh are all involved in extension of the hip and flexion of the knee. Extending the hip, flexing the knee. Um, they are all broadly innervated by the sciatic nerve. Um, we can go into a bit more detail with that when we chat about it, but the, the overall nerve supply to this group is the sciatic nerve. Um, what else? Number three, Yeah, there are three three muscles that are involved um, in this group. One is divided up into two parts, a long head and a short head, so you can kind of think of it as four if you want to. Um, but yeah, three slash four muscles. And you can divide them into the ones on the medial side of the posterior thigh and the ones on the lateral side of the posterior thigh. That's the way to sort of keep them apart. Um, number four... The M in semi stands for medial. That's a nice thing to remember. Um, and finally, number five, all of these muscles bar one, one part, will cross both the hip joint and the knee joint. So they will act on both joints. Yeah. Extension of the hip, flexion of the knee, innervated by the sciatic nerve. Three slash four muscles divided into lateral and medial. The M in semi stands for medial. And what was the last one I said? Oh yeah, they all cross both the hip joint and the knee joint, so they act on both. Yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll whiz through this. Okay, so very quickly, the functions of this group. So it's extension of the hip and it's flexion of the knee. So I'm hoping we are generally happy that from the standard anatomical position, extension of the hip is moving the hip backwards. Yeah, that's extension of the hip. And then flexion of the knee is bending the knee. Yeah, so this posterior group are gonna be responsible for pulling the, pulling the thigh backwards, pulling the femur backwards, and then flexing the knee, yeah? The interesting thing about this is the muscles in the posterior thigh, they do both of those things. Very difficult for them to do both at the same time. Yeah, so if I, if I have like fully flexed my knee, so fully sort of bent my knee as much as I can, there's actually going to be limited amount of extension that I can do because the muscles have already shortened. Yeah, and if I wanted to further extend my hip, I have to straighten my knee out in order to allow that sort of to happen. Yeah, so it does do both. It extends your hip and it flexes your knee, but actually difficult to do both at the same time, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, so the nerve that innervates this compartment, um, again, like with all of the, well, most of the compartments of our limbs, muscular compartments, there tends to be a nerve in common. Um, so all muscles within that particular group get innervated by that particular nerve. For the posterior compartment of the thigh, the nerve to remember is the sciatic nerve. Yeah, um, so when, you know, in, in the thigh, your anterior compartment is always your femoral nerve, your medial compartment is always your obturator nerve, your posterior compartment is always your sciatic nerve. Now, the problem with the, well, yeah, the problem with the sciatic nerve is that it's very, very variable from person to person. Um, and in particular, where, where branches come off the sciatic nerve, how long the sciatic nerve actually is before it splits and lots and lots of different things that are very very different from person to person so i'm going to try and talk about that a little bit but i would say if, if there is one thing one answer to the innovation of the posterior compartment of the thigh it is the sciatic nerve so it's worth talking about it a little bit okay and um, the sciatic nerve 
biggest nerve in the human body, yeah, on a specimen, when you look for it on a specimen, you can't miss it, yeah, it's a very, very, it's about sort of, you know, one to two centimetres thick, you know, this, this nerve running down the back, running down the back of the thigh. Um, also a very, very important nerve clinically, sciatica is neuropathic pain caused by irritation or inflammation of the sciatic nerve, which is a very, very common health complaint. So it's worth knowing about the sciatic nerve. Now, the sciatic nerve, um, like most of our nerves that supply the lower limbs, the sciatic nerve also comes off your lumbosacral plexus, um, that plexus coming off the spinal cord where all of the various nerve, spinal nerves, nerve roots come together and swap fibres and then come apart and give off, give off these peripheral nerves, yeah? Um, the sciatic nerve you would describe as coming more off the sacral plexus rather than the lumbar the sacral part of the lumbosacral plexus rather than the lumbar part of the lumbosacral plexus um, because most of its nerve roots is coming off the sacrum, yeah? Um, and yes, in particular, the nerve roots that make the sciatic nerve are L4, L5, S1, S2, S3, yeah? So from L4 all the way down to S3, yeah? Five nerve roots because it's a big nerve, yeah? It needs a lot of nerve roots to make it, okay? So, you probably need a bit of context for this. Um, so, this is meant to be a posterior view of the bony pelvis, yeah? So, we've got the lumbar vertebrae coming down here, and obviously, these would have their spinous processes coming off the back all the way down here, yeah? So, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. This is the sacrum, so these would be the posterior sacral foramina. Yeah, the, the holes on the back of the sacrum for the nerves to come out of. This is going to be the ilium, and we can imagine sort of this bit around here is going to be where we're going to see our posterior superior iliac spine and our posterior inferior iliac spine on both sides. Yeah, and then you've got the iliac crest and everything like that. These bits here, so here and here, these are going to be your ischial spines. Yeah, sticking out the back of, well, yeah, sticking out in the female bony pelvis, they stick more directly posterior. In the male bony pelvis, they angle slightly more inwards, yeah? But sticking out the back is the ischial spines. Right at the bottom here, we've got the ischial tuberosities. Ischial tuberosity, yeah? And then between these three landmarks, yeah, between the posterior inferior iliac spine and the ischial spine, we have the greater sciatic notch, sciatic notch, and between the ischial spine and the ischial tuberosity, we have the lesser sciatic notch. Yeah, I hope. I hope that's, that's slightly clear. Um, so, looking at the uh, sciatic nerve in particular, so we said the sciatic nerve L4 to S3, yeah? L4, L5, S1, 2, and 3. So, the nerve root always comes out below the vertebrate, doesn't it? So the L4 nerve root is going to be coming out below L4, L5 coming out below L5, and then, if I just get rid of these labels, L1 is, uh, sorry, S1 is going to be coming out of this here, S2 is going to come out here, and S3 is going to be coming out here, yeah? Now, it's worth saying that at this point, yeah, yeah, okay. At this point, these nerve roots are coming out anteriorly, yeah? They're coming out in front of the sacrum and in front of the ilium inside the pelvis, yeah? So actually, this is, these holes are meant to be representing the anterior sacral foramen. Ah, oh, I've screwed that up, haven't I? Yeah, fine, we'll carry on. So these are these are meant to represent the anterior sacral foramina, yeah? The holes on the front of the sacrum because that is where these nerve roots are actually gonna come out of because when they first emerge, this is actually anterior, yeah? So actually, if I sort of try and represent that, these sort of dotted lines coming out here, yeah? This is gonna be sort of dotted lines, okay? Because it's in front of here, okay? Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, 
once these five nerve roots have come out, they then come together to form the single sciatic nerve, yeah? So if I just try and represent that, so we're gonna come down here, we're gonna be in front of here, in front of here, in front of here, in front of here, in front, and then coming down sort of here. To form the big sciatic nerve. Yeah, so this is how this is how these these five nerve roots come together to form the sciatic nerve. It is within the greater lumbosacral plexus, which is obviously giving off loads of other branches, loads of other nerves, but for the sake of this video, that is how the sciatic nerve is formed, yeah? And currently we are inside the pelvis, yeah, because they've come out anteriorly inside the pelvis. We then need to get to the back. The whole reason I drew this posteriorly is because the sciatic nerve does end up at the back of the thigh. So having been in the pelvis, it has to then get out of the pelvis through the back in order to go down the back of the thigh, yeah? And the way that it gets out is through the greater sciatic notch, yeah? So for that big curve between the posterior inferior iliac spine and the ischial spine, yeah? Once it's formed inside the pelvis, it then comes through that notch and then starts to make its way down the back of the thigh. Yeah, so in terms of looking for the sciatic nerve, if you're ever asked to look for the sciatic nerve on a specimen, lots of places to look, but one, a good one, would be to find your greater sciatic notch. Now, you might have to peel some muscles out the way, like your gluteal muscles and all of that sort of stuff to see it, but once you get down to this, you will see the greater sciatic notch and you will see a big chunky nerve going straight through from anterior to posterior, and that is going to be the sciatic nerve there. Okay, cool. And then the sciatic nerve, yes, once it's out of the pelvis via the great sciatic notch, it is then going to go down the length of the posterior thigh. So again, you can often easily see it if you just look at the posterior thigh of a specimen, you'll just look for the biggest, chunkiest structure that's not a muscle, obviously, and it's likely to be the sciatic nerve. Now, eventually, the sciatic nerve does split into two major branches, yeah? It splits into two major branches, which ultimately are more important once you get below the knee. They're not that important in the thigh, but depending on whereabouts the sciatic nerve splits will determine what role these nerves play in the muscles that we're about to speak of, yeah, about to talk about, okay? So, eventually, da, 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 let me just tell you what, let me just fill this in a little bit more. Um, the proportions are going to be entirely wrong, but let's, let's pretend that this is all the way down to the bottom of the femur, um, and then that's gonna be the tibia, do, 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 with the fibula sort of there, yeah? So this is the knee joint, yeah? At some point down the length of the femur, the sciatic nerve splits into one branch that will just carry on straight down the back of the knee, which is going to be your tibial nerve. Yeah, just to be clear, this is sciatic. Yeah, and we'll also give off another branch which will go more laterally around the neck of the fibula, which is your common fibula nerve. Okay, so they're the two main branches of the sciatic. Once you get below the knee, all of the muscles down there are innervated either by the tibial nerve or by the common fibula nerve, and both of these are branches of the sciatic. Okay, now. If the arrangement was like this, then we can say that all of our posterior thigh muscles that are all up here, yeah, they're going to be innervated by the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve will give off like some tiny muscular branches, muscular, muscular branch, mu Jesus Christ, muscular. <laughs> So that's kind of salvageable. Um, we'll give off some muscular branches to supply those muscles and then won't split into the tibial and the common fibular nerve until we're very close to the knee joint. 
However, in some people, what you might find is that actually that split happens all the way up here. Yeah, and this is the tibial, and then that is the common fibula. Yeah, and if that split happens all the way up there, then you might actually find that some of the muscles that we're about to talk about, they're actually going to be innervated by one of these branches because they form so high up that they're able to give off fibres to supply those muscles in the first place. Yeah, um, the reason I'm going into so much detail here is because if you look at different sources, different sources will tell you different things. Yeah, some sources will say posterior compartment of the thigh, sciatic nerve. What are you worried about? It's all the sciatic nerve. Whereas some textbooks in particular will actually go and say that certain muscles are innervated by the tibial branch of the sciatic nerve and other muscles are innervated by the common fibular branch of the sciatic nerve. So you might get some discrepancy between your sources, but this is the reason why. The reason why is because it is very variable from person to person how long the sciatic nerve is before it splits into its tibial and common fibular branches. Okay, so yeah, just want you to be aware of that. Um, and don't get caught out by it when you're looking on specimens. Yeah, if you're looking in the posterior thigh and you come across two things that look like nerves rather than just one, just ask yourself the question, could these be the tibial and the common fibular nerve? And actually to find the sciatic nerve, I've got to go all the way up, you know, deeper into the gluteal region in order to find the single sciatic nerve. Yeah, just something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, that's the sciatic nerve. So your take homes here are L4 to S3. Yeah, L4, L5, S1, 2 and 3. In the sacral plexus or the sacral part of the lumbosacral plexus, they come together to form the single sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve then leaves the pelvis via the greater sciatic notch and will then go down the back of the thigh. At some point, it will split into a tibial nerve and a common fibula nerve. And ultimately, these are going to be the nerves that will supply everything below the knee. So if you were to lose your sciatic nerve, everything from the knee down is gone. Yeah, so just be aware, this is a big nerve and it's an important nerve, yeah? From the thigh, it's the posterior compartment. Below the, leg, below the knee, it's everything. Okay? Cool. Okay, fine, so the muscles themselves. Um, so yeah, so at the beginning, uh, let's think of it as four muscles. Um, four muscles in the posterior compartment. I quite like that because then for your whole thigh, it goes eight, six, four, yeah? Eight muscles in the anterior compartment, six in the medial compartment, four in the posterior compartment, eight, six, four. I quite like that. So I'm gonna teach you like that. Let's think of it in terms of four different muscles, okay? Um, but just be aware that two of those are actually two separate parts of the same named muscle, yeah? Um, okay, just before we dive into those, again, just a little bit of bony anatomy. I hate bony anatomy, but obviously it's, it's relevant, yeah, for your origins and your insertions. Um, so again, posterior view. Posterior view of what we're looking at here. So um, uh, lateral, laterals on this side, medials on this side. Uh, this is the pubic symphysis. So this is the body of the pubis, superior pubic rami, inferior pubic, oh God, inferior pubic rami. This curve down here is going to be the ischial tuberosity. Yeah, the, the, the most inferior part of the bony pelvis, the bit that you sit on. Yeah, um, head of the femur, neck of the femur. We've got the greater trochanter up here, the lesser trochanter here. And then this is the shaft of the femur going down here. On the posterior side, um, I didn't actually need to dot this actually because I can fill it in, I'll just fill it in. Um, on the posterior side of the femur is where you have all of your various lines and ridges to pay attention to, yeah? Um, so in particular, the big line that goes down the back of the femur, the posterior femur, is your linear aspera, linear aspera. And if you look, the linear aspera is made up of two lines that form at the top and then splits into two lines at the bottom. Now the two lines at the top, your medial line is your pectineal line, and laterally, it has different names, you can call it the spiral line or the gluteal line. Um, 
but that's those two down there. And then at the bottom here, we're splitting into our medial and our lateral supracondylar ridges. Yeah, so that's the arrangement of the linear aspera, two lines that form it at the top and two lines that come off it at the bottom. Okay, um, and then obviously down here, we've got the tibia. So this is the posterior aspect of the tibia. So medial side, lateral side. This is the fibula with the head, the neck, and then the shaft. Okay, so they're broadly speaking your bony, your bony landmarks. Now, the really nice thing about the muscles of the posterior compartment of the thigh is that by and large, there's a single origin to know about. Yeah, the single origin is here. Yeah, your ischial tuberosity. When in doubt, yeah, your ischial tuberosity is the bony landmark of the posterior compartment of the thigh. Yeah, so that's a nice little just bridge of knowledge. Yeah, bony anatomy is boring. It's so dull. So you've got to try and find ways to link it to more interesting stuff. Yeah, so ischial tuberosity, bony bit at the bottom of the pelvis, that is the landmark, the bony landmark of this, of this compartment. Okay, now the muscles themselves, let's get the names up on the board to begin with. So we've got four muscles, I said, yeah. Um, so we have got, which one should we do first? Let's do semitendinosis first. We then have semimembranosis, semimembranosis. And then finally we have biceps femoris, long head, short head. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Yeah, four muscles of the posterior compartment, okay? Now, two of them are called semi, yeah? And the M in semi, stands for medial, yeah? That is the way that you remember that the two semi-muscles are gonna go down the medial side of the um, posterior thigh. Both heads of the biceps femoris muscle are gonna go down the lateral side, okay? The M stands for medial, okay? So let's do the two semi-muscles first, yeah? So the, the medial muscles um, of the hamstrings. I've not actually used the term hamstrings yet. Um, just to be clear, certainly these three, semitendinosis, semimembranosis, and the long head of biceps femoris, they're referred to as the hamstrings. Um, and I think it's to do with like how they used to hang meat up in avatars. You know, something charming like that. I don't know. But um, yeah, your hamstrings, this is what we're talking about, yeah? Okay, so semitendinosis, semimembranosis. So let's do, uh, what am I going to do first? Let's do membranosis first. Semimembranosis, okay? Origin, ischial tuberosity. Nice and easy. It has to be, yeah? Origin, ischial tuberosity, okay? The insertion of semimembranosis, remember I said the majority of these muscles, as a general rule, these muscles cross both the hip joint and the knee joint. They act on both, okay? So semimembranosis does not attach to the femur at all. It's gonna go completely past the femur and ends up inserting onto your medial tibial condyle, yeah? So here, okay? And basically, this is what it looks like. It just, it is, it's a far straighter muscle. It just goes all the way straight down. And that is semi-membranosis, yeah? Incidentally, membranosis, the membrane that's being referred to there, is like this really like nice silvery, it's almost like a fish scale-like membrane that you'll see when you look at these muscles on actual specimens. Um, why it has that membrane, I'm not entirely sure. I should probably know that. 
I don't know. If anyone does know, or if anyone looks it up, put it in the comments. Um, you can teach me. Um, but yes, it's called semi-membranosis because it has a very, very nice membrane on, particularly sort of the more distal part of, of the muscle. So you can very easily identify it like that, okay? Um, but that's semi-membranosis. So semi-membranosis, technically, because it's coming off the pelvis, it does, it is crossing the hip joint. I know it originates below the hip joint, but if you think, we're, we're going to be pulling against here, aren't we? So it is still going to extend the hip, yeah? And because it crosses the knee joint as well to insert onto the tibia, it's going to flex the knee, yeah? So that's semi-membranosis. Semi-tendinosis is the other medial one, yeah? So it's, because it's got M in it, so it stands for medial, yeah? So this one, again, has to come off the ischial tuberosity. Yeah, same origin point, yeah. But semitendinosis has a bit more of a wavy course, yeah. When it first comes off the ischial tuberosity, it is slightly more lateral, slightly more to the outside of semimembranosis. It's a bit more sort of this way, yeah. But then once we come sort of down here, I just scribble this in. Once we get sort of down here, the reason semitendinosis gets its name is because it does sort of taper out into a very long tendon, yeah? And that's the distinguishing feature between these two. When in doubt, look for the tendon, and that's how you tell semitendinosis, semimembranosis apart, yeah? Once that tendon is formed, so let's say it's come together down here to form the tendon, the tendon then actually wraps around semimembranosis, so it passes more medially to it again and ends up going a little bit further down the tibia to insert sort of onto the medial, onto the medial shaft. Let me just sort of fill that in. Yeah, so that's semitendinosis, okay? So it is sometimes difficult to tell these two apart because they're very close together, they have exactly the same origin, they, broadly speaking, have very, very similar insertions, and because they sort of twist and turn around each other, it can be difficult to tell them apart, yeah? So if, if put on the spot in a time-pressured exam environment, yeah, and you need to tell these apart, the thing to look for is the tendon. Yeah, the one of these, you know that they're the, we're looking at the medial, the medial hamstrings because the M in semi stands for medial. If you look for the one with the tendon, that is going to be semitendinosis. Yeah, but just be aware that if you're down here, if you're at the distal end, it might be that tendinosis is the more medial and membranosis is a bit more lateral. But actually, the, the majority of the bulk of these muscles it's semi-membranous that is more medial, yeah? And the way to remember that is it's got another M in it. Yeah, medial, medial, super medial. Yeah, semi-membranosis is the most medial of these, yeah? Whereas semi-tendinosis, only got the one M, so it is a little bit more lateral to begin with, but just be aware of that tendon that sort of makes its way, snakes its way across down here. Okay, and again, crossing both the hip joint and the knee joint, so we'll act on both the hip joint and the knee joint. Hip extension up here, knee flexion down there. Okay, and then last but not least, we've got biceps femoris. So, biceps femoris, obviously biceps means two heads, yeah? Um, in the same way that biceps brachii is the two-headed muscle of, of the upper limb, which flexes the elbow, biceps femoris is the exact equivalent in the lower limb, isn't it? Remember, we used to be four-legged animals. Yeah, so from in evolutionary terms, there's gonna be a lot of muscles in these limbs that have sort of equivalent counterparts. Biceps femoris is the equivalent of biceps brachii in the lower limb, yeah? Um, and we've got a long head and a short head, yeah? Now, the long head of biceps femoris follows all of the same rules as our two semis, in the sense that its origin, ischial tuberosity. Always ischial tuberosity, up here. Yeah? Now, we've done our medial ones, so we know that the biceps are more lateral. So once it comes off the ischial tuberosity, the long head of biceps femoris does go all the way over here. Yeah, it goes all the way down here to make up the sort of the lateral side of the hamstrings. 
yeah? And that there, we'll, we'll pause there, yeah? But that is the long head of biceps femoris coming off the ischial tuberosity, making its way down the lateral side. The short head of biceps femoris, obviously it has to be shorter than the long head, yeah? And the way in which it's shorter is this one is the only one that doesn't come from up here, yeah? The short head of biceps femoris comes off the lower aspects of the linear aspera and the lateral supracondylar ridge here. This is where the short head of biceps femoris comes off. So just like that, yeah? So obviously just make a mental note that the short head of biceps femoris obviously does not extend the hip. It can't act on the hip joint because it doesn't cross the hip joint. This one of the four is the only one that only acts on the knee, okay? So this is the long head, this is the short head, yeah? Ultimately, they come together. Yeah, they come together to form the single biceps femoris tendon. Biceps femoris tendon. And because we're on the lateral side, it has to attach to the lateral bone that's below the knee, yeah? So the biceps femoris tendon will insert onto the head and the neck of the fibula, yeah? Because the fibula's on the lateral side, okay? So ultimately, it's all one tendon, yeah? I, I, I really think you, you, you won't be able to distinguish between these two parts because they will act as one unit. But just be aware that of these two, if you do divide them into two parts, the long head is both a hip extensor and a knee flexor. The short head is only a knee flexor. Yeah, and again, it, not to overcomplicate things, but going back to what I said earlier about some sources will insist on innovating these with tibial or common fibula nerves rather than just the sciatic nerve. What you usually find is that these get assigned the tibial nerve and the short head gets assigned the common fibula nerve in some sources. Yeah, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. From my point of view, sciatic nerve for all of it, without exception, yeah. But I just, I, I want you to be aware that if you come across stuff like that, that that's the reason why, yeah. Um, and, but that's it, that, that is it, that, that is the posterior compartment of the thigh. Um, ischial tuberosity as the common origin, yeah. Um, the M in semi stands for medial, so our semi-membranosis, semi-tendinosis are on the medial side of this posterior thigh. Look out for the membrane and the tendon, yeah? And then biceps femoris, you divide into two parts, our long head and short head. The long head comes from the same place, crosses both joints and inserts down here. The short head only comes off the posterior femur, linear aspera and the lateral supracondylar ridge, and then joins the long head in a single tendon, to insert down here, okay? Like I said, it's the easiest of the three compartments. So hopefully that's not too bad, despite my artwork. All right guys, that's the end of this one. I hope that was useful. Um, so remember your basics to build on. Yeah, posterior compartment of the thigh, it's hip extension and knee flexion. It's innervated by predominantly the sciatic nerve, but just be aware of those branches that come off it. Um, four muscles in total, um, two of them are called semi, um, the M in semi stands for medial because they're on the medial side of the posterior thigh and then the other side you've got the biceps femoris with its long head and its short head which goes down the lateral side, yeah. Um, all of those except the short head cross both the hip joint and the knee joint so they'll act on both, the short head only crosses the knee joint, yeah. I hope that's okay, I hope that's, um, I hope that's been useful. If you enjoyed the video, please like it. If you enjoy me, please subscribe to the channel. And if you've got any feedback, please put it in the comments below. Um, right, thanks very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a good day.